Uh, welcome to the second episode of Playtime Online. This is the Institute of Play's brand new webinar series that connects you to all that's happening here and all of the interesting things the Institute's doing right now with design, play, and learning. I'm Amna Siddiqui, the producer and moderator of uh, the program. And uh, today we're recounting our experiences from the Mobile Quest Summer Camp we ran in Chicago this past summer. We'll be discussing the open source platform ARIS and touching on a few lessons learned when teaching 70 middle school students uh, how to make their own iPhone games. Uh, I encourage everyone to please ask our panelists questions during the discussion. You can submit your questions by clicking on the blue participate text under the video on the right hand side. Uh, we'll spend the last 15 minutes of this webinar answering your questions during our Q&A portion, so please stick around for that. And I can assure you that today's panel is pretty excited to answer your questions. Uh, so without further delay, let's meet our speakers. Uh, today we have five amazing artists, designers, and educators who We'll be discussing mobile location-based gameplay. Uh, and we'll be also talking about how to best approach designing experiences for supporting children's learning. So without further ado, Nancy, do you want to start off the introduction? Sure. Hi, I'm Nancy Novacek. I am a strategist in informal learning and social engagement here at the Institute. And I kind of helped. Uh, put MobileQuest into action this summer. I was working with Amna to plan and produce and oversee the camps. Uh, Lindsay? Yes, my name is Lindsay Bates. I was one of the instructors with the MobileQuest, assisting the kids with learning the ARIS program, developing it, and then putting it into action. And John? Oh, oh, John, I think you're muted. Scott. So my name is John Martin. <laughs> I'm with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm on the ARIS development team. And I've just been having fun watching you guys from a distance. Awesome. Don? Yeah, my name is Don Miller. I work at the Institute of Play. And this summer, um, I assisted Nancy and Amna and Lindsay with running Mobile Quest, both in New York City and in Chicago. Great. And Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Holden. I'm at the University of New Mexico. Um, I'm also on the ARIS team. Um, I've been making mobile games since 2006 and helping other people make them since, I don't know, about 2009. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. So let's uh, get this conversation started. And uh, I guess uh, I'll start with you, Don. Um, could you tell us a little about what, a little more about what MobileQuest is? Okay, so MobileQuest is a week-long camp that this summer we ran in Chicago and New York City, and it serves as an induction experience for sixth graders that are coming in through the Chicago Quest or Quest to Learn here in New York City, and um, they, over the course of the week. They, the students create a location-based mobile game, so um, using the ARIS platform. But before that happens, they learn the basics of game design uh, through modding game, through looking at games, modding games, then creating paper prototypes, um, and then physical games, and then finally moving on to the ARIS platform a few days in. So by the time they end up using ARIS, they kind of understand the type of games that they they understand the type of games they can make. They understand rules and mechanics and um, the play space, and um, they use Aris, they go outside, and um, they iterate by making games first in the classroom, on the computers, and then taking their mobile devices outside and testing their games, and everything culminates at the end of the week in an exhibition where parents and friends, family, are invited in to see the students' uh, work that they've created throughout the week. Awesome. And how many years has it been going on? Um, this is, I believe, the second time that's been run in Chicago, and it's been going on for three or four years at least here in New York City. Awesome. And uh, John and Chris, uh, I'd love to, to have you guys explain a little bit more about what, what ARIS is. Chris, you want to start? OK. So. Eris is um, it's an augmented reality uh, mobile gaming platform. 
which means that it's, it's a piece of software that runs on iOS devices um, that people can use to play games, usually ones that, that take place outside and are map-based. Um, and then it's also um, an easy-to-use drag-and-drop authoring tool that um, you use uh, through, a, a f right now, a Flash-enabled browser. So, so most computers, but specifically not iOS devices, can be used to, to make ERIS content. Um, people use it for a variety of things. A lot of it is sort of outdoor place-based storytelling. Um, other things are, are data collection type activities um, or, or games that are based around collecting things out in the world. There's also a lot of people that, that use it to make um, games that, that are, say, museum-based, um, that, that take place indoors instead of outdoors on a map, and they usually use QR codes instead of uh, the GPS functionality of these devices um, to, to access content in the ARIS game. Um, I don't know. What, what else, John? That's well, sort of my of basic. One of the things that I really like about it is that it, it is a great prototyping tool in that people who start playing with it, they can very quickly um, take an idea, drag and drop onto the map, and almost immediately they can start testing it out. They, we have a quick travel tool so that they don't even have to actually go out to the locations that they dragged it to. They can just try it on their device immediately. And the, the feedback loop for success for that, because of that, is really short. And people can start very quickly saying, oh, I get how this works. And um, they start building off of that success over and over again. I should also mention that it's free and open source. Yes, that's that's a important important fact. Um, great, and I think what uh, what John was talking about that's kind of how uh, MobileQuest used Eris. Um, and I guess uh, Lindsay, I would like to know since you know you are you are a teacher there. Um, you know, how was it uh, watching your students learn Eris? Uh, you know, it was it was very fascinating and, and hilarious watching them use Eris. In that, when it when we took them first the analog steps in creating the map and understanding the map layout, they seemed very huh huh. But when it got right into the phones of of the Eris being that their children already indoctrinated into the technological age, they just grasped onto it right away and just ran with it. It was, it was really fun to watch. That's great. And Don, you were also a teacher, if not at Chicago, but, but in New York. Um, what, what was your experience with, with watching the kids uh, learn and use Eris like? Um, well, I think um, the great thing about Eris is that um, after a few days of um, you know, talking about games, talking about rules. When we went into Eris, there's, um, you know, very simple building blocks of logic that exist in order to, you know, um, have an item show up or get an item after you visit a location. And the students really resonate with that quickly, and it allows them to make, you know, rather complex um, games um, from very simple components. And um, I, like I think John was saying, um, they can test right there which is really great to see if the functionality is working. And then when they go outside, it's great because, you know, it's one thing to test something in there. You know, the logic's working, but when you get outside, it's really exciting to see the students say, oh, wow, you know, I need to make that a lot closer because I don't want to walk all that distance to get to this location. So it's really interesting because on the tech side, the kids get it right away. And then when they go outside, they really get to see how different it is when you're in that physical game space. And that's what's really exciting. And right, if I can, that's just that's a really interesting. Um, the point of that is 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 great because you can play test in front of the computer, and it's great play testing in front of the computer. But the real aha moment takes place when you're outside, and you're like, oh wow, that you know this game is way too big, or it's going to be way too big based on what I just thought looked very short distances on the map. It actually turns out that it's too far to walk, or or I forgot that we had to across this really busy street or, or something like that comes on and now all of a sudden it becomes real. Yeah, totally, exactly. Yeah, Nancy, did you see anything like that when you were out there? 
I what did I see? I I saw yeah I saw I saw a lot of chaos. <laughs> um, I saw I saw a lot of kids. Uh, yeah, they were like it. It's it does create this really um, interesting gap between kind of fantasy and reality between like what what the kids kind of imagine their game world to be and then what actually happens when it hits the physical ground of public space. Um, there are all those things that were just talked about. Like kids didn't realize that like oh they're actually like. <laughs> They placed two important pieces on either side of a really steep hill with a statue on top, and you know they realized that they kind of had to to go and understand the framework of the public space as much as they were understanding the framework of their game space. Great, awesome. Um, so I guess now we have a. a, a Pretty okay understanding of, of what Mobile Quest is, what Eris is, and how how the how these two work together, and how the how the kids play it. Um, so I kind of want to get into process quickly um, before the kids are actually starting to play their their Eris games. They're uh, creating paper uh, prototypes using uh, paper and pencil. So instead of handing them a phone phone immediately, um, they have to do like the the, the basic uh, design planning and, and that kind of process. I'm wondering if, if Don or Lindsay, you could talk about that, uh, being in the classroom before the kids get outside and, and teaching them about the, the design process. Do you want to go first, Don? Hey, go ahead, please. Okay. Well, within the process, we did an introduction of the basis of errors. Then from there, as I stated earlier, we went over an analog step just to show them how the map sequence would look the individual attributes that we would add on to it, then give them the step-by-step -step procedure of how we're going to implement that onto the phone devices. Then from implementing onto the phone devices, also making them aware of any glitches that may arise and then how they can overcome those obstacles. Then to, with all that knowledge, they were able to create the game desired in the map sequence that we were given and then took them into that location and then had them play the game in the location. Done? All right. Yeah, sure. I can pick up here. So the basic question, if I could reiterate, was to just um, say the difference between the paper prototyping and then when they got Eris mm -hmm. and having the paper first, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, one thing I noticed um, that was really great is that um, when you have a paper prototype and the students um, are introduced, well, we introduce them first the type of things you can do in ARIS. There's still like a lot more freedom on paper because the students are like, okay, I want to have this item here, I want to have this item here, you know, and I want to, you know, have a dragon here, and you need to get a sword before you get to the dragon. So you get these elaborate kind of narratives, and then like I came back to earlier, it's really interesting once they're faced with ARIS because then they have to kind of fit these narratives into the mechanics that they have available electronically, you know, um, with Eris, and that's where I think the real challenge is, and I, I really like that because, you know, they have these narratives, but then using the tools available, they kind of have to shape it into a game, but I think it's super powerful because um, you get a lot more creativity on the forefront that way, and then you have the students kind of pushing the Eris platform to the max rather than just saying, oh, I see what we have to work with here. I'm going to use an item. I'm going to use a character. So it's interesting to have all that creativity kind of front-loaded and then pushing the platform harder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, so what kinds of things are the kids actually learning when they're, when they're outdoors? Um, I'm curious to, to hear from the Eris guys, as well as Lindsay, Don, and Nancy, just kind of everybody's perspective. Um, well, all right, uh, I'll start a little bit. And so I don't know about these kids. I haven't, I've, I've only heard what, what the people here have said about what they've been learning. But um, it sounds like they're learning how to make games and how to, how to take an idea that's in their head or on a piece of paper and, and fit it into an existing system. And then, and then use what they know about that system to try and make the system do things that it wasn't designed to do. Um, and that definitely matches on with my own design experience using tools like this and then those I've seen in, in the people I work with. One of the like sort of hard skills that you don't necessarily think about until you watch people go out and try and play one of these games is um, you know, sort of reading and following a map. Being able to know which direction north is and how to go towards something that's on that map. Um, it's not something we usually think about, but it's definitely there. Um, anyone else have some things they want to add in? 
Well, I'll just, um, let me, again, build off of what's already been said in, in some ways. This idea of the constraints of the game and the constraints of the physical place, when they interact with each other and the, 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 the designers, you know, whatever age they are, have to say, well, wait, I want to do this in the world, but Eris doesn't let me do this, um, wait, unless maybe I can go about and do it this other way. And then you start figuring out sort of workarounds, and figuring out workarounds is, is the basis of improvisation. It's the basis of what we do in life. You know, if this road is blocked, we have to go find another way to, to get to our location. Right. Right. To piggyback off of that, the first location that we went to when we were in Millennium Park, um, for those of you who may have never been in Chicago, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a big metallic beam that's in the middle of, of the park. That beam created such an issue for the kids in the connectivity on the signal and the locations where they needed to pick up their information notes. And just as you stated, John, this is how they were able to improv and say, well, can we go to a part of the park where there's a lot of, or not a lot of metal here? <laughs> and we did just that, and that's how we got around it. Yeah, I actually think that's a, a perfect segue into our, our next section. Let's talk about what happened at Chicago. At Chicago, uh, at Grant Park, at, um, at Cloudgate, at uh, the, the J. Pritzker Center. Like, let's talk about all of it. Nancy, uh, you yeah. look like you're, you're ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Um, because we, in the planning of these camps, uh, we have, we, you know, we've we'd used Eris in the past. And uh, I guess the past two summers, the kids had worked on the High Line, which is a long, you know, a long, a long skinny space on some raised uh, train tracks in New York City and the, the feedback from the game designers and the previous teachers was that that space is really really too linear and not didn't allow for a lot of um, kind of interesting interactions that the kids were looking for so we moved in New York we moved it to a big field on the West Side Highway and when we were looking we were looking for sites in Chicago uh, you know the camp was at DePaul University which is a great location right right in downtown um, and is really, really close to Millennium Park. And um, being a big fan of Millennium Park, I thought it'd be great to put the uh, the camp the camp's game and situate the Eras games there. So there's a there's a Millennium Park, as it turns out, is a couple of different parks rolled into one. Um, there's the part that has Cloudgate and the other large art art installations, and then it's next door, adjacent to the Pritzker Pavilion. The Pritzker Pavilion is a big field, much like the one we used in New York, uh, where thank you very much, where uh, you know they they play concerts and have events, and it's this like kind of perfect game space. We thought um, what we didn't know is that this is actually a private park and uh, the, the park, the park is a, has been a victim of its own success um, and by that I mean apparently it gets so much foot traffic that they have to close it every so often to give the grass a break. Um, but nowhere in any of our research had, had any of these conditions suggested themselves. So uh, Don and Amna and I and the, the team of game designers uh, at the Institute of Play, Claudio and Shula had all worked together to kind of cite the main points of the, the kind of the outdoor components of Eris in this pavilion. And we got there and we were totally shut down. Um, to the tune of I was running through the park to try to find the officials, to find who, who was in charge to see if we could circumvent that, that situation. And I was met with three no's in a row. So then we quickly um, tried to just move the game over to the like the public part of Millennium Park right around the bean. Um, I think Lindsay started to talk a little bit about that. Um, it was a kind of incredible moment where we were on our phones to Shul and Claudio who were back in New York who were like dragging all of the game components and resituating them uh, around the bean and then we got everything around the bean and nothing worked again. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a big metal object in the middle. Um, and so I think at that point, uh, Don and Amna, you guys went, went, on, went on walkabout to try to find yet another location, correct? Um, which is about, I don't know, about a quarter mile away down in Grant Park? Yep. Yeah, and I yep. think that was uh, 
Lindsay and Lindsay, you and your 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 teaching partner originally uh, told us about this space, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, you saved it. We needed somebody from Chicago to be like, look, this is where there's not tourists and a bunch of other things going right. on where we could go. <laughs> yeah. Little did we know, it was located right next to where Lollapalooza was going to be happening. <laughs> In a couple days. So on our on our on our last day when we had the exhibition, we also had bands playing right next right. door. But at, least, right. but at least it still was the most ideal. It was a place where a concert was happening next yeah, to it. We made it work. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So so what's the lesson in this? What kinds of things should we be anticipating when looking for a game space? Right. So uh, oddly enough, I think. Um, my learning from this is that is that like these like the kind of almost kind of like kind of large sidebar spaces in public space things spaces that aren't already like highly specified um, seem to be better locations for the, for 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 these for these kinds of creative um, creative endeavors. Um, both our game designers and our teachers here in New York. And I think the kids and the teachers in Chicago, like, it seemed less intuitive to just pick a big wide open space than a place with, like, I think, you know, some, some kind of landmarks and things happening. But in, but in both cases, this kind of more generic, large, freer space turned out to be a better kind of space of possibility for kids' games. I don't know if anyone else has anything to, to add to that, but that's a pretty big piece of learning. Um, and also that we really needed to do a lot more research about um, the, the nature of different kinds of public spaces and what they require and actually who controls them. Yeah. So to me, this, this is really interesting because from the very first time we were you know, making outdoor games, we found time and time again that, that the, the specifics of the place, even if we don't plan for them or, or, you know, sort of want them to, they bleed through. And we end up finding out about the place where we're, where we're doing this activity and, and, you know, sort of what goes on there, whether it's running into people, running into problems, um, the specifics of that place end up mattering over and over and over again. And we find out more about the places that we're trying to work in. Um, so sometimes it, it gets in our way in terms of not being able to play the games where you want. Um, other times, you meet interesting people and find out things that you wouldn't have known before. Um, I, th I think it's always a, an interesting thing um, having sort of your plans come up against reality in that particular way. Um, I guess another, I guess, let's see, another example is, um, well, every time I would design games with Jim Matthews, who's another person on the ARIS team who couldn't actually be here today, he would always find some neighborhood resident um, wherever we were playing a game, find someone to go and talk to, and then find out about the history of that place. Um, it was amazing how he could just find people. And so it's something that, it, you know, when I'm taking students around for the Spanish game in the neighborhood here, I'm trying to find people to talk to. Um, sometimes I'll find people that only speak Spanish, and then I go and grab the students and bring them over and help, have them help translate to, to meet these people. Um, other times, I don't know, maybe we'll get yelled at. Um, a, a good example of, of a game that we were making and play sort of bled through and we weren't expecting it was one of the games we made earlier was called Hip Hop Tycoon. And, and Ben Devane actually started that game, but, uh, but I took it over at some point. And the idea was that you could play it in any school's backyard. Instead of being tied to a specific park at a specific lake, the way all our other games were, the idea was it was supposed to be playable anywhere. And so we chose a middle school that was next to a strip mall. So, you know, pretty generic. Um, and, and had kids play it there. But in the papers, right around the time we were playing the game, we found out there was a, a big brouhaha about what stores were planned to be in that strip mall. Um, so this game is all about starting your own hip hop store. And the, the controversy in that particular strip mall was Best Buy wanted to open up there. And this was a neighborhood north of Milwaukee. And the people in that neighborhood had some weird feeling that if there was a Best Buy open up there, it would bring the wrong people into that neighborhood to buy music. 
I don't really understand it, but it was apparently a big deal and, you know, sort of organized around the exact issue that the game was about, even though we totally didn't expect it. And I can chime in on this as well. With um, Sick at South Shore Beach that we looked at, and actually a couple of the other environmental games that we created, um, just the kids, or the, the students, the players walking around and getting goose poop on their shoe is an interaction with place that really drives in the, you know, it, it's sort of a light bulb. It's like, oh, maybe the, all of this goose poop washing off into the watershed has some effect on, on, on this. And sure enough, it does. So people start to, the designers will start to, whether they're us or the students' um, designers, they, once they get out in the field, they start incorporating new things into the field, into the game itself, based on that experience. Um, another really quick example was, for my dissertation, I had my um, campers run through a, a four-day trip through the woods um, using the sort of augmented reality uh, platform. And at one point, they went off, off, off the main trail. And all of a sudden, they started to realize what, like, trees are much closer together, one said, than I thought that they were. Well, of course they are, because whenever they walk in the woods, they were always on the trail, which are, is this huge, wide path that's beautifully kept for you. But once you go off trail, the trees are closer together than you would think that they are. So learning about the affordances of the place really enrich um, what is learned. And it causes people to see the places that they are experiencing through a different lens because of it, I think. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I'm trying to... Uh, how many days uh, were, the, were the kids playing in that area? Was it just for one day, or was it, was it over a couple of days? It was over a couple. I'm sorry, which one? Oh, oh, yours, John. The dissertation one? Yeah. All right, so it was a, it was a four-day trip. So okay. So three nights and, and four days, uh, which created all kinds of problems as far as device batteries and, and things like that. But, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a long-term trip. Yeah, actually, well, I mean, I think that um, something that maybe Nancy or, or Lindsay can or Don can talk about is, you know, I, I think we 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 lost um, lost that affordance, like some of those affordances, when we kept having to change the location. Um, we were only we, we were at the the bean one day, we were at the the pavilion the other, the next day, and and then we were at Grant Park, and I feel like the kids didn't really get to explore uh, like the same space and figure out different uh, different kinds of different I guess uh, they didn't figure out how to improve the way they could use that space and, and learn from it um, Nancy, I do you can, have any yeah I can talk about that um, yeah that that's absolutely what happened um, I mean there was there was kind of a there were, there were kind of like a, bu a bunch of layered factors that I think uh, in hindsight, you know, really det detracted from the kids' abilities to be the best designers they could be. Um, the first was this, uh, like, kind of over overarching um, issue of place, and it's you know, it's simply because we we are New Yorkers trying to trying to cite um, an experience in a in a place that we're that that we know a little bit about. But don't know enough about. Um, so, so that that one thing is that you know we we need to mobile mobile quest is really an experience um, that's kind of hyper local in a way, um, and that making mobile location based games at least with kids in such a short amount of time like really has to be produced fully to its fullest extent by a local contingency. Um, so that the kind of place was definitely one factor, and then then this, and then the kind of the event space of summer was another factor, right? Don mentioned that uh, Lollapalooza was happening, which was like a, it was a huge distraction. I mean, I, we were we were trying to make sure you know that we were keeping track of the kids. There were kind of huge crowds everywhere. There was thumping bass. There there were various closures around Grant Park that you know were kind of causing like more havoc. Um, and then the third component was, you know, the, the technology that we were, that we were, the kids were kind of struggling with. So there was, they were, we were using um, iPhone 3s, right? Correct? I, I and, and 
you know, there there was just like a real kind of there were like a lot of obstacles to hurdle um, given the nature of these phones in interfacing with Eris in public space. So um, a long way to say like there was yeah there was like I think a lot of hurdles to kind of really getting to that amazing place-based learning that that um, mobile quest when using Eris I think can really get to. Mm -hmm. And I guess I also want to I mean just quickly touch on the technology that was used because um, I think that was also a, a, a part of our one of our hiccups. Um, Don could you could you talk about the technology? I mean yeah I think um, technology is going to be a hiccup just about everywhere you do anything. <laughs> I mean, there, there's, it's, it's the thing that you can never anticipate, you know. I mean, from, you know, what computers the students are going to be using every day in a shared lab space, they don't have the same computers every day, to, you know, um, some phones have better battery life than others, um, you know, slightly different, you know, connectivity to, you um, data networks that allow for connection to the Aris server or GPS, which we realized, you know, is two separate things to figure out where you're located in a space. So, I mean, I mean, I guess the, the only thing you could say is have the best computers available and have the best devices available. But even then, you know, there's a lot of things that um, can go wrong and you're going to, um, the best thing you can do to prepare for that is to go to the location, I think, ahead of time with the devices that you are going to be using, have the computers and just do a test and you know, um, so whether it is out in you know, a camping trip or just in a park, you know, do as much testing as possible ahead of time um, to eliminate any variables because there's always going to be things that you don't anticipate. Um, and I guess the other thing I should mention about that is that um, you know, at the end of the day, um, the people that are most worried about the technology hiccups and things not working are us, and the students really learned a lot, you know. So I think in the moment we were freaking out over a few things in Chicago, more even than New York City with some of the technical problems we had, but the students are still learning how to create games. They're still play testing, and they're also learning from some of the technology problems that we have as well that teach them, you know, because when you have these problems that arise, the students need to learn a little bit about what's actually going on behind the scenes. So, like I said, at the end of the day, the students are still learning, and the technology hiccups are going to be dealt with, and it's probably the teachers and the organizers that suffer the most from it. If they're really probably the only ones that suffer. So, right. that's all. I don't know if anyone agrees with that. No, well, I, I actually, I have a, sorry, Lindsay, I just, I, so this yeah. points to the question. Um, I want to know from the Eris guys what Mobile Quest was like for them, because we were on the phone and we were um, we were texting you guys and we were emailing you guys madly, um, especially during Chicago, trying to find trying to find Barack Obama. <laughs> I remember that. Um, what was this? There was um, there was a bug in one of the students' games. I mean, I know we were going, uh, we were trying to talk to you guys and to David. Um, hey, Don, can you mute yourself? Um, uh, we were trying to talk, we were trying to get in touch with you guys because we were having um, some response time, and some response problems, and some, um, and then we were just having some bugs in some of the students' games. And Don, I remember, was uh, on the phone going, I can't find Barack Obama, I can't find Barack Obama, um, who was in, who was like one of the assets in one of the students' games. And so, um, one of the things I'm most interested in is, you know, what um, Chicago Mobile Quest uh, was like for you guys, and, and if you guys were receiving any of our communications, or if that was other folks on your team. John, were you there at all? I definitely wasn't around for this. I I think I was out of people in at camp during this time, so it, it was probably Dave and, and Phil. Okay, it was probably Dave and Phil. And this, do you guys know anything about? I think I think we might have crashed your server, or you had reached an, the 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 number of users, or um, we. Th I think we did something, and there Let's was a there was a kind of uh, there was a there was a big problem where at some point, and I was just really interested in finding out what was happening from your end. I I don't remember hearing about that. Okay. What. When was the was when was Mobile Quest? I think it was the first week of August. 
First week of August. Yeah. Okay. So um, one thing that I do remember that was going on with Eris at that time, um, that, that was um, just one of these weird little technical glitches. So it wasn't the, the number of users, I don't think. Um, one of the problems was there was the number of the number of numbers that Eris was allowed to allot itself to items, to media, to media things that you upload to Eris. And it, it was only allotted a certain number for that variable to go up to. Um, and, and it had been hit. And I was making a game at that time too and was just banging my head against the wall because stuff that I knew how to do for years wasn't working and I couldn't figure out why or what was happening. Um, so I do remember that. Um, in terms of the stability of the server, that's one of the things that um, has been sort of interesting in terms of Eris being like kind of an indie project and yet wanting uh, to, to make a server that, that is reliable when there's hundreds of people on it to be able to pay for that. And the way it works right now is that the Minnesota Historical Society, through the project that they're working on, needs that um, robustness and stability for the server and is essentially paying the way for everyone else. So they're, they're paying, paying for that hosting to work. Interesting. Hmm. So wait, what do you, sorry, what do you mean by that? That they're, they're, so they're paving the way? They're, they're paying for it. So there's, so we um, have, I don't know if it's an Amazon EC2 account or what, but you know, some hosting account somewhere. And the, the way that the, the bills for that work is the more you use, the more machines they essentially turn on. Um, so that, so that um, if a lot of people are using Eris, it, it, the machines can scale to um, make that use available. Um, so that there's not a bottleneck when a lot of people are using it. Um, and then when they turn more machines on, they charge us more money. But the Minnesota Historical Society is footing that bill for all the Eris users right now. Um, so, what, so what? Um, what do you? What do you? What do you see as the future of Eris? Do you, given given this incredible popularity of the platform, I mean, are you? Uh, is there potential for other organizations to kind of? put Eris on their own servers and serve it? Like, what, have you guys talked about this? Um, well, the way that, we don't really know because we're just sort of moving from moment to moment. Um, I think the way that it's worked out for a large project to be able to fund the resource for everyone um, has been pretty easy to do. It's not an expensive bill, but it's not something that, you know, I could pay for my institution right now. Um, and so I, I think seeking out partners to, to make those contributions to make Eris better for everyone is, is a model that we're interested in going forward and seems to have worked pretty well over the last couple of years. Um, so other partners that have given us little bits, um, often money just to hire a programmer, um, ha have been the Pearson Foundation, the New Learning Institute, um, certainly uh, engage at UW-Madison. Um, John, who are some of the other people that have sort of made things happen monetarily? Well, so Pearson, of course, and um, the, the Library of Congress is starting to. Um, mm -hmm. There are a number of like small, um, smaller pots of money, I guess, that we're able to, to, to draw from as well. But one of the points that I'd like to make is that Eris can be run on any server. It's all open source, it's all free, and so anybody can set up their own, you know, shingle and, and become a, an era server. So far that hasn't, and I think that we expected that to happen a lot more. I don't know if it is actually happening at all. But it seems like so far everybody's playing on the same server and um, to, scale, to scale up accordingly, as Chris mentioned, we have Rackspace now, which um, will just turn on another machine and give us a little bit more space and be able to handle a lot more users as needed and then throttle back down um, when you are playing. Great. Okay. Well, we have to start the, the Q&A session in, in a couple of minutes, but I'd like to wrap up. And um, I'm just wondering the, the future goals of MobileQuest. Um, you know, where, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here, you know, taking uh, just all that we've learned this past summer and even I think this, this conversation um, with, with John and Chris has been really 
you know, and, and Lindsay, it's been very enlightening. So um, what, are we, what are we doing next summer? How's that, how's that going to go down, Don and Nancy? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, so one of the biggest things that we've, we've learned from MobileQuest is that, especially last summer running it for the first time in Chicago, um, was that um, actually the key to MobileQuest are its teachers. Um, and, and Lindsay was a kind of a, a great example of what a great mobile quest teacher looks like. But um, we really learned that the key to kind of helping, helping this experience um, happen in lots of other places outside, outside of New York City is really to help train teachers and informal educators who, um, who are part of institutions who want to run mobile quest. So we are, um, we are, in the midst of, of thinking about um, all of the things that we'd we'd need to put into place to kind of run basically a mobile quest institute where we can train some train some teachers to um, take that experience back to their home context to run their own kind of robust versions of mobile quest great um, anything from you Don since you guys I know you guys are, are working on this together closely no I'm, I think it about sums it up Okay, great. And then I think we, we touched on, you know, your, your future goals, Chris and John, but is there anything that, um, any, any future goals that you'd like to think about or talk about that, ha are, are, that relate to MobileQuest, kind of the future of MobileQuest and helping, helping that camp, uh, kind of, helping that camp's experience? So one of the things that we just started to work on um, this year, and we're slowly expanding it, is the idea of um, more interactions in the field, more interactions by the players. Um, we've recently unveiled a, a notebook feature so that people can actually go out and do inquiry. They can do field research out wherever. Um, so making a game doesn't have to be the creation of a narrative. It's not really even a game necessarily. But you can field a couple of quests or a couple of questions, um, say, in a park, go find five trees of X variety, and then the students can go out and they can oh. take the, those trees, and they can tag those trees accordingly, and then other students can comment on those trees and say, "Oh no, no, that was an oak. You were supposed to be looking for the pine." Um, not that those two are really easy to confuse, but um, and they can vote up and vote down on them, and so these player-to-player -player interactions are becoming increasingly. Are, or can be increasingly more important. But the actual creation of the game then is just a simple matter of asking, asking a couple of good questions that will um, sort of facilitate these player-to-player -player interactions in the field. Awesome. Yeah. And then um, oh, I, I just want to also uh, ask Lindsay, um, would you teach this again? And you know, what kinds of things would you recommend moving forward? You know, let's say if we, if we did the Mobile Quest Chicago camp next year. Mm -hmm. Yo, yeah, I definitely would teach it again. One of the things that I would recommend is having the teachers do their own recon of the areas as well as the developers to work more hand in hand so that way when it comes to the troubleshooting, the teachers can be that first line of making sure that the devices work properly instead of having to take the issue to the developers and then wait for that reply back. Great. And any any last comments? I'm, I think we should move on to the, the question and answer portion. Um, okay, so uh, let's see here. The first question is from Miranda, and she asks, uh, how do you take students to the next level of design? I'm working with interns who have input game aspects, but are tripping up on the requirements and setting up the quest. Do you have suggestions for training or settling that up for students? Hmm. I think I think one thing to do, and this is this is something that we saw in Mobile Quest this summer, is that kids kind of understood the basic, like that games have mechanics and they have components, you know, and they take place in a space, but. Um, there, there did seem they seem to have get to a point where they they were really excited just to have created something, and to get to get them to the point of going of assessing of actually evaluating that something and whether or not it was a um, 
a really kind of exciting game to to play for others um, was something that we saw happening in Mobile Quest. And so I would suggest um, co-creating a set of criteria of what makes a good game with your with your with your interns or whoever whoever you're working with as designers. So um, a really important part to the design process. Uh, is is not only understanding the constraints under which you're designing and the goal of the thing that you're designing, but then the criteria by which you'll judge your ideas. And so I think really strong criteria about what makes a good game um, are really it, like as important a starting place as the idea itself. Does anybody want to add to that? Um. Just really briefly, one of the things that we talked about earlier was sort of being able to try out your game as soon as you've made it. Um, and so in terms of getting requirements to work, um, actually being able to try it out and see if the game behaves the way you want it to, and then going back in when it doesn't and changing something, um, using that feedback loop to learn how to do requirements has, has been a real aid to the people that, that I've been trying to get up to speed on Eris. But it is a legitimately difficult part of making games. So I would add that that um, making games in a group, even if it's in like the same room and you're working on your own game, really helps because when you get caught up on certain things, you can just ask the person next to you, and there's a good chance that they will have already run into that problem as well. But if they haven't, they're going to. Um, and so it's nice to have sort of that group think going on. If you can't do it with a bunch of other people in the same room, or if everybody in the room is stumped, hop on the Ares Games Google group and ask the community because we have, what, almost 5,000 designers now? So there's a very good chance that somebody else has run into that problem. And if nobody has, then you know the developers want to know about it. It's going to be a big one. Great. OK, so I'm going to ask the, the next question. This is from Edge. And uh, they ask, how does working with Eris change in regards to the, the change in maps in iOS 6? Easy answer there. It doesn't change anything. It works so perfectly, fluidly, as if nothing ever happened, with the exception of the underlying maps look different. So if, the, if Apple forgot to leave your town on the map, then that's something you're stuck with, I guess. Um, but yeah, Eris doesn't notice the difference at all. It's, it's really nice. Hello? Everybody? Oh, OK. I think, I think we had a, a technical issue. Yeah. It says that we're still on air, so I think we should still talk. Uh, OK, so did we answer that question? I think everybody's muted. So I think, um, I think we answered the question. Um, there's not a big difference in, in Eris with the Apple the Google map, other than the map application is a little bit different. Um, and so as Chris was saying, if, if Apple's map is screwed up a little bit, then what you see is going to be screwed up a little bit. But and my personal experience has actually been the opposite. The maps load much quicker. Um, you don't need as good of an internet connection to get a map to show up on your screen. Um, I, one feature that's out there for Eris is the ability to add custom maps that's new. I haven't even gotten used to use it myself yet, but the idea is you could put an image, and instead of seeing Apple or Google's version of what the Earth looks like, you could see mountains and dragons and things. Hmm. You can do your own treasure map. That's awesome. <laughs> but again, I haven't played them with that either. So. All right, so I'm going to ask a, another question. This one is from uh, Juan. He asks, uh, one of the things that I notice with Eris is that it can be very text-driven to convey the story in the game. Have the tools introduced uh, lately, like notebooks, et cetera, made that more interactive? Um, how are they used in programs in Chicago and New York? Uh, and he, he wanted to also mention that he loves Eris. Did, did any of you at, um, in MobileQuest find that uh, ways to have students tell stories visually 
or orally or you know, sort of not so much with text? Lindsay, Don, or Nancy, do you guys have? I'd Sorry. say a lot of the students um, did end up using text at least for kind of the um, the introduction was pretty text heavy. Um, many of the students use visual assets, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, and none of them really used. Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the pic most of them were just kind of text driven early on, and um, you know, since we only had a couple days to develop it, um, uh, they were rather simple uh, kind of. Uh, from there on out, where they would get an item, it would be very clear what you have to do with it next. But we didn't get as deep with the dialogue, um, so I don't know what I'm what I'm saying here. But um, <laughs> basically, they used um, they used text, but I wouldn't say it was it was too heavy. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Three day. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lindsay. Sorry. Oh no, I was just saying I agree with Don. Yeah, I mean, so the kids the kids in effect are basically they work with Eris for two and a half days. Uh, over the course of this camp, and um, and it that nets out to be probably a total of twelve hours. Um, so, like, kind of, a, like elaborate um, uses of dialogue or narrative, I think get get pushed to the back. Um, so, in 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 the kind of the struggle to finish to finish what, like Don said, you know, what started is like really elaborate game structures um, to try to kind of. Take take their game ideas, learn the platform, and get them into the platform, and then deal with the the constraints of the public space. Like that's a that's a lot, and the fact that they do it um, is amazing. Uh, so I I would hope that I would hope that um, these like robust narrative tools uh, could come into play over kind of a longer form engagement uh, with the with the design process in Eris. So I, I can talk a little bit about this. Um, one of the things, one of the big goals for Eris is to have that, uh, what was that, um, sort of a, a, a zero smile and three clicks, that idea of like a very short turnaround to be able to reassure your confidence in creating a game. So a lot of what we've been doing is trying to keep it as simple as possible while allowing for longer term development by the professionals who have more tolerance for ambiguity or who want to dig a little bit deeper into it. That said, the notebook tool that we're working on right now, we can do a lot with it, but it's not as simple as we'd like it to be. Um, we can do spawning, which is a new interaction. It's still not as simple as we'd like it to be. We can do trading now, the, the new map overlay that um, Chris talked about, but we haven't figured out how to make those as easily accessible as text. Text is a great for prototyping because you can just type in a short description and go. And for a twelve hours, a twelve hour game to design a game, that's that's what you want. You can't jump into something too difficult, um, or at least we haven't figured out how to do that yet. All right. Uh, okay. So the the next question is from Jennifer from Minnesota, and she asks. Uh, we are curious about uh, how you guided the students on content. Was it completely open for them? Was it based on the physical space? Did you ask a guiding question or provide topics? Uh, I think uh, Lindsay and Don, this question's for you guys. Let me see. We will cover some. Well, one of the ways that we guided the students through the content was within the parameters that Eris set up. So when there was a problem that arose, just as how Don was speaking, is the way that we reacted to the issue. If we acted overly frustrated, like we didn't know what was going on, that totally turned, that would have turned the kids off and it would have made them that much more frustrating. So one of the ways that we guided them through the content was just that staying calm, letting them know it's technology, it happens. So with, with some of the options that are available to us, these are how we're going to get through the issue. And it seemed to work with quite a few of the kids. And the, um, the follow up there, just uh, based on the, on the content, um, yeah, it was completely open to them. Um, but it was based on physical space to address both parts of that question. So we did have uh, maps that we printed out both in Chicago and in New York of the space that we were going to use and when the students were paper prototyping they got a copy of the map and then they had little cut out pieces of paper 
that represented different items that were available in Eris, and they literally pasted it up um, on the map. And um, that way they could actually kind of visualize the space before they were there. So I think that that was a really good technique because then when they went to the computer, it was um, they already had the paper prototype that was more fleshed out with all the different rules, the narrative. We actually made them pre-write the text for any of the item boxes. So when they got to the computer, they had the computer, they had their paper prototype. They, it was based on the same physical space that they were looking at, and we're like, okay, well, here, type in this address. Now zoom in until you see roughly the map that you saw on your paper prototype. Now start taking that stuff and inputting it into error. So that was the first step. There was like a one-to-one -one correlation between physical space and, um, on their paper prototype and in the game. But like John um, and Chris were saying earlier, of course, all that changes because once they're inputting things like, okay, well, what do you want the distance of this to be? Oh, you know, make it 20, 20 feet. Or said some students like, well, you know, how, how, how big is 20 feet? And they actually don't really know until they get outside. So I hope that answers, uh, answers there. Yeah, I just wanted to say one last thing about that. Um, while, while we didn't guide, uh, guide the students' content, I was just recalling the names of some of the games. Uh, World War Three, Vegetable Wars... Um, and there was something about a bacon game somewhere in there, because um, this this experience is really um, just like an incredible like kind of catalyst experience into game design and mobile platforms. Um, but um, you, as as the Eris guys are pointing out, that um, Eris like Eris can actually be like wonderfully content specific. Um, one could imagine like an infinite world of games from even like a simple prompt around a simple topic or a simple simple location or a simple date. Awesome. Okay, so I think we have only a, a time for a couple of questions. Um, so this one comes from Jolie's uh, from Global Kids New York City. Uh, she asks, what are some tips, tricks, or suggestions to allow for more randomness and decision making within games as opposed to a more linear narrative? Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess maybe some of the Ares guys could talk about this if it sounds like it's a, it's a relatively technical question. Right. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple different ways to go about it. Um, the hard one, the one that takes a lot of time, is to write a branching narrative in, inside Ares. So if you know how to write a linear narrative in Ares, all you have to do is make these branching points and then repeat your work a bunch of times over and make sure all the interconnections make sense. So that's a lot of work as a designer. But it, you can do it. Um, something that is, is a little bit different would be um, to use the spawning features in Eris, which is specifically, instead of placing your, your game objects on the map one by one, you can create rules for them to generate themselves either around locations or players at certain times and under certain circumstances. So a really simple game to play is, is Rupee Collector that uses spawning. Um, and, and that way the, the play of the game is generated by sort of what players do under these random circumstances, and it's, it's not linear. Um, another one is to use the notebook features to sort of think in terms of data collection activities maybe more than a game that is authored, um, because those, those sort of take a life of their own as people try to accomplish them out in the world anyway. Um, some other earlier ones are, or ideas are where you can create scarcity of, of items among players and in the world, um, and then the interactions of the players based around that scarcity can, can generate things that are, you know, sort of generate their own meaning and feel nonlinear in that sense. This, this idea of scarcity is a fantastic one. It's really um, because all of a sudden if it's no longer a game between you and the computer or a game the designer has figured out the branching narrative and gone through this whole simulation thing. Now all of a sudden, it's a player pitted against player, and those player-to-player -player interactions can be fantastic. Whether it's through the notebook, um, where you have to collect things and then have other people like them, and requirements, you know, you can set requirements that the quest is done if five people like the thing that you've done. Um, so you can create these player-to-player -player interactions or the scarcity where you have to like decide do I want to go for the blue rupee or for the red rupee? Which one will be the, the longest? I don't know. And will the other team get there sooner than I will? 
Awesome. All right. Well, I, I we're out of time, so I'm, I'm going to stop it. Uh, there were still a couple of questions left, but uh, for, for those who, whose questions weren't answered, please check back in a couple of days. Um, the panelists here, I'm going to send them your questions and, and they'll answer it, and we're going to post them on this page. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, Nancy, Don, Lindsay, Chris, John. Uh, it was terrific having all of you guys here today. Uh, for our viewers, if you'd like to continue the discussion, uh, we'll be opening the comment section right after this broadcast. Uh, please tune in uh, to the next episode of Playtime. It airs Wednesday, December 12th, and uh, our design team is going to be talking about uh, taking classroom learning to the next level, and they'll be workshopping a brand new product uh, called Playforce. Um, and please don't forget to sign up for our mailing list uh, to hear the latest things uh, about the Institute of Play or, or just about Playtime in general. Um, all you have to do is click the Join Us at the top of this page when the webinar is over. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. If you like what you're seeing, please spread the word about Playtime Online. Have a great afternoon, everyone. See you guys. Bye. Bye.